Welcome to Ditch Digger CEO today, David. We're happy to have you. We've got uh, Robbie on the line with me, and we're going we're gonna to pepper you with questions and listen to your story and have a lot of fun with you today, if that's okay with you. Sounds great. Good to be here. Good to be here, Gary. Thanks for joining, so, David. Yeah, so, so, da so David, uh, you know what? We, uh, we, we, I, I just know your, your story, and, and I, and I want to get to know you in person someday because you seem like you got a heart of gold, and that's, that's, I surround myself with friends that, that do. Um, and, and your, your story, your business, everything's around, um, you know, culture and, and values and, and, uh, you know, and, and fun. Right. So uh, right, I guess we want to, we want to really hear about your, your upbringing and where, where it all came from. So if you can hear about that, I'd love to get into everything else after that, but tell, tell us about, uh, where this all started, man, where, where, where the, where the story of David Hassel started. Yeah, that's great. So I was, uh, I was born in Manhattan and, uh, mid late seventies. And, uh, my, uh, my parents had worked for companies their entire careers. In fact, uh, my dad started, my dad was a, was a musician, uh, in, from England and he ended up on a cruise liner as the cruise director. Uh, oh, my wow. mom met him on the cruise ship, uh, from Union City, New Jersey. Oh. And uh, he eventually moved to New York. My grandfather had been a jeweler. So, uh, my dad was really, his heart was in music, wanted to get a job at Sony music on fifth Avenue in New York. Uh, they didn't have any openings at that time, so we walked down the street to Tiffany and Company and uh, got a job selling watches, thinking he'd be there temporarily. Uh, they had some background in that, and that was 1972. Uh, he's still at Tiffany and Company today, uh, almost 50 years later, uh, retired at 65, but then kept working 40 hours a week. Uh, around that same time, my mom started as, as a nurse at NYU Medical Center, uh, all also retired at the same time and is also still a nurse at NYU Medical Center nearly 50 years later. So wow. very different track my parents had. Uh, neither went to, uh, to, to university. My mom obviously went to nursing school. Um, and, you know, there were really wonderful things about that path, uh, you know, creating, you know, a, a really beautiful, great family upbringing and, and home and a lot of stability. Um, but there were also things about working for, for another company and not having that sense of direction and control that I think, you know, I think a lot of times kids will, will uh, rebel in some way and kind of choose a different path than their parents. And I think entrepreneurship was that for me um, cool. and seeing all the things I didn't want, uh, but also being, you know, them instilling great values and, and supporting me growing up and, and, and seeding the idea of, of what could be possible. I remember my mom gave me a cutout from the New York Times once that said, uh, even, even a great idea is only an idea until you make it real. And there was just something about that that triggered something in me. I put that up on my mirror in my bedroom. Uh, I just had this idea, that was this concept that I could go out and actually uh, uh, create things uh, as opposed to just following the rules. Uh, so I had that for a age. Now, uh, how, about how old, how old were you when you, when, you, when you did that, when you pinned that up on your mirror in your bedroom and thought about that? I think that was probably 13 or 14, 12, somewhere between 12 and 14, around there. And, uh, you know, the first thing, when I went off to, to high school, I went to this, uh, I chose to go to a high school that you know, required me commuting on a train for an hour and a subway for 20 minutes down in Jersey City, New Jersey. So I had a lot of freedom at an early age. And uh, I remember uh, pretty much the first week of school, we were in this band room uh, in the basement. And as we, you know, when I had music classes, and as I walked out, I noticed there were these light bulbs up in this ante room. Uh, this red light bulb and a green light bulb, and there were windows into these two rooms. And I, I was like, huh, I wonder, you know, what was this space? And I come to find it used to be a television studio where oh. they, uh, they used to broadcast to the, to the, uh, to the local community uh, on cable news. And uh, the one little tiny, what used to be the control room, had all this old, amazing NBC camera equipment in there. Uh, and so I found, once I found that out, it was using used as a junk room. I petitioned the school to get some, some funds to, uh, to actually kind of bring it back alive. They gave me some space. And, you know, by my senior year, we were producing a late live daily show, kind of like a tonight yeah. show style thing where, you know, we had the, I got the funniest kid in school to sit behind the desk and we, you know, bring down teachers and interview them. Uh, and, uh, that was just a really fun thing to so create something like that. Yeah. Uh, sadly, awesome. it fell apart when I left, and that was one of my big learnings is that, you know, if you're going to create something, you can't, it can't just be all about you. You've got to create the systems and processes and bring other people in to own something if you want it to have continuity. Yeah. 
Cool. That's that's a great lesson you learned there. No doubt about it. Well, that's such a that that would be so much fun. And and think all the memories other kids could have if they could have they, they could have been sustainable, exactly. right? Thankfully, someone else did about ten years ten years later bring it back to life. Right. So so it is a thriving thing now. Awesome. And uh, okay, so, so you, uh, high school and went you went you went you go to college, go to university or no? I did. I went to Tufts. I studied computer engineering um, at that that time I was really interested in, I think I was interested in just this idea of could we use technology to improve medicine actually. I was, I was curious about biomedical engineering, but this was the uh, mid, mid 90s. Uh, computers were just starting to kind of come to the fore, at least in the, in the form of being networked. And so I went off to Tufts and I studied computer engineering and got really into software and, and, and the internet. Uh, and so when I, when I graduated, uh, I, I had this bug that I wanted to start something and be, be an entrepreneur. That was clearly in me. Uh, there were entrepreneurial things I did in college. Um, but when I, when I graduated, I still didn't, I didn't have an idea. And I actually honestly didn't feel like I had the confidence to go out and start something. So I went to work for a big consulting company. Uh, and I, I, I ended up, um, working in a, what I call beige cubicle land in a window, windowless computer office in Roseland, New Jersey, building insurance technology and uh, uh, working from 9 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. at night and just remember saying to myself, like, I can't, I can't believe this is my life. I, I, I can't do this. <laughs> um, and so, you know, uh, I was a high performer. They gave me two raises in six months, almost doubled my salary. And I said, look, I, I just, I need to do something different. Send me on a client. They sent me out to Denver, Colorado. And that was fun. I'm 23 years old. I'm flying out to Denver every Monday, back every Thursday. Uh, eventually convinced them to give me a corporate apartment instead of uh, paying Marriott. So I could go ski every weekend and fly my friends out with the plane ticket. Uh -huh. That's where we go, yeah. So, you know, I did a lot of that. Um, and uh, really, you know, kind of, Fell in love with skiing, which is still a big part of my uh, my outdoor life. Um, but uh, but during that time, I met somebody uh, who was a really had a really good business mind. He was a consultant at the same company, and this was in 1999, just as the dot com was 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 really getting close to its peak. Yep. And so we left in the summer to fall of 1999 and started an ad tech company in New York City. Uh, just before everything kind of uh, fell apart. Uh, we raised about $800,000, um, moved into an office, made a lot of mistakes, uh, but, but I learned a lot about uh, running a business and navigating a major downturn as well during that time. Yeah. Wow. What, what did that company do? It was advertising technology. So uh, I was looking at the market around this time when I was working for the consulting company, looking at companies like DoubleClick, who had gotten into this market, if you remember at the time, online advertising was essentially banner ads. And yep. when they first put banner ads up there, we still had this idea, some people even talk about it today, of surfing the web. And what, what it meant to surf the web was you didn't have a purpose. You'd go on a website, it was this novel thing where there was this information, and you'd click a link and go somewhere else. And then you'd right. click another link and you'd go somewhere else. And that was the idea of surfing. Yes. Um, and so banner ads came out. And people were like, oh, my God, here's a cool another thing for me to click. So when they first introduced that, the, the click rates relative to the impressions were very, very high. Right? And so they were able to sell these impressions at a very high cost per thousand CPM. And, uh, and then over a period of 18 months, I watched the click rates plummet by about 90%. So these companies, wow. you know, losing like, oh, my gosh, this industry is collapsing. Why is this happening? Well, it turned out. People have grown more task-oriented on the web. That was my, my, my assessment of the situation. Like, you want to go read the news. You want to go read your email. You want to check the stock site. You don't want to click something and go buy something in the middle of right. what you're doing. It's more purpose-oriented. So we came up with a theory, like, you know, could we actually interact with somebody in an ad without them leaving what they're doing and then communicate with them to a sale later? And so we started uh, delivering coupons to these ad placement holders, uh -huh. uh, which, you know, at the time, it was a really neat, fun idea, and it, and it worked, um, but, you know, six or seven years into that process, uh, while I'd learned a lot about running a business, and I learned a lot about my strengths, I also learned that I can't, I didn't really like doing something that I wasn't very passionate about, ultimately helping people sell uh, things they probably didn't need to 
to sell or people didn't need to buy necessarily. There were, you know, a lot of people, a lot, 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 lot of people looking to use the internet to, you know, just sell more stuff. And I thought it's interesting. It's, you know, it's an interesting technological problem to solve, but it didn't feel like connected to a sense of fulfillment or purpose for myself. Okay. In coming, David, from a, a background of the computer engineering and focusing and more on the software side of the house, you mentioned that you had someone who was more business-minded. Yes. I'd be curious, uh, from your perspective, what sort of takeaways or skills that the business-minded individual uh, has the ability to learn from software without ever being a full software engineer or, or programmer, uh, and how that applies to growing the business like the way you guys have and will continue to. That's a great question. You know, in that case, my, my partner at that time didn't have a technical background. And I think it actually caused, uh, there were areas where it caused some friction. Um, because I don't think, it's hard to have empathy and understanding for something that you have no context for. Uh, now I'm in a position where I've been the CEO of 15.5 for nine years. And, but I, ha and I haven't actually seen a line of our code, which is, I pride myself on that. I have a, a chief technology officer and a, you know, 70 person engineering team that builds all that stuff out. Um, but, but I can, I understand the technology and I can relate with people who are doing that kind of work. Um, whereas I think in my, in my, in the ad tech company, you know, there was some friction and conflict, uh, because in that case, you know, my partner was always wondering why we couldn't just go faster or why it didn't work certain ways. Um, and I, th I think so it's, it's useful to have that, that background and understanding. And would you say that focusing on the product management, would that be a good takeaway for someone who's more business minded to better understand how that process works or? I think it's, uh, it's finding, ultimately finding someone you can partner with and who you can fully trust. Okay. Right. And so finding somebody who has that deep level of expertise uh, like in my case, I have a, a, my CTO who I actually hired in 2003 while I was building this ad tech company. We worked together for three years. He was the, one of the first engineers I hired, and then you know, he was responsible for a whole product. Uh, and then when, when it came time to start 15.5, you know, we had that relationship, and I, I trusted the way that he worked and his commitment and his technical acumen. Uh, and so I think that that's, you know, yeah, I think that that's probably one of the things I would advise. Awesome. So from there, from that business, then uh, David, what, you know, what, what, you know that, that shut down then, it was a sold, what happened there? Well, it's actually still going today. Uh, my, my original partner's still running it. Um, we did execute a buyout, so I, I ended up with an earn out from that business and, and uh, moved out to the Bay Area. Uh, at that time, I also started with, uh, with a couple of friends, an adventure travel company in Brazil. I found myself uh, really interested in kite surfing. Uh, um, and I was pretty burned out from the ad tech business. So I thought, you know, I, I had this idea that this whole kite surfing thing back in 2004, 2005 was going to become a big thing. Nobody knew what it was. In fact, uh, the gentleman who told me about it, I was living with a couple of Brazilians in Manhattan at the time. And there was this mysterious, tall, dark Brazilian guy named Alberto who would fly into New York in the summers, uh, make a bunch of money working at the Boathouse restaurant in New York City, and then fly back to Brazil uh, and be able to live the rest of the year on the beach kite surfing uh, because the exchange rate was so good at that time. Yeah. And, and Alberto kept talking about kite surfing and kite surfing. And in my mind, in my mind, cause he's got this thick accent, I'm thinking he means windsurfing cause I don't, you know, I, he's just using this funny terminology. So one day he actually shows up at my apartment with all this kite surfing gear. I realized it's not what I thought it was. He shows me videos and I said, you have to teach me that right now. <laughs> and so I learned how to kite surf on the beaches of Long Island in 2004. So I think this is going to be huge. We should start a business. And we started running adventure tours in Brazil in 2005 before the whole world discovered this was one of the premier locations. Uh, and we do these 10-day downwind adventure tours using dune buggies and land rovers where, you know, you drive on the beach and have your clients out in the ocean kiting, kite surfing downwind from the waves. Oh. Uh, and that was just an awful lot of fun. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I joke that my first business was all about chasing the money, but ultimately there was no passion in it. 
And then I decided, all right, well, if that didn't work, I have to go follow my passion. And my second <laughs> business, the kite surfing business, was all the passion. And I realized, well, there's no money in it. And, uh, and so I had to go through this, you know, decade of my life learning both sides of that equation to realize I actually need both. And ultimately, 15.5 is, uh, is the expression of saying, okay, I'm not going to compromise profit or passion. Uh, I think we bring those two things together.